how nice to be here uh, in this uh, wonderful institute. And I did not know the history of it, uh, but it makes it even more fun and important for us to be here on the 97th the birthday of, uh, of this institution. And indeed, um, we need to understand each other better. This is uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely for sure. I'm going to apologize right at the start that at 6 o'clock I have to leave, so I'm not going to hear all the wonderful other speakers. Uh, don't take that as a, uh, or a uh, wrong thing other than just a, an extraordinarily crowded uh, calendar right now. Maybe a good place for me to start to discuss the issue of uh, U.S.-China relations is uh, with the, the book of uh, a good friend of mine, someone very well known in our country, um, who's very clever, and I uh, fundamentally hope he's wrong, but he keeps on being right about things, and that's John Mearsheimer. Uh, and many of you follow uh, Professor Mearsheimer at the University of Chicago. And he wrote a very good book that, again, I really disagree with, but it's a great book. Uh, in 2001, uh, The Tragedy of Great Power Politics. And as our super realist uh, in international relations, uh, John sees great power politics as being filled with uh, confrontation and frictions uh, and uh, basically uh, a kind of struggle for survival uh, and very much a zero-sum world in which the gains of one side are the losses of the other uh, in this power struggle. And as an economist, I see the world very differently because the actual basic idea that goes back to Adam Smith is that an interconnected economy is a win-win proposition, uh, that economics is not zero-sum but positive-sum, that there are gains from cooperation, uh, gains from the division of labor, gains from specialization, gains from a large market that uh, creates an acceleration of innovation and uh, gains from the fun of being in a world in which you can taste other people's food, enjoy their culture, listen to their music, travel to their societies, uh, and um, uh, benefit from cultural diversity. Well, I go back to John Mearsheimer because in his book, The Tragedy of Great Power Politics, he writes that at the time of that book, it's either 2001 or 2002, I don't remember exactly. He says, great power politics is quiet right now, but we will get back to confrontation. So give him a check mark. Uh, and he said, uh, we'll have confrontation between the US and China, because China's going to rise. China's going to become a much more powerful country. And that will lead to confrontation. And I read that and I thought, no, it's good if China rises. That's good. Win-win. Games. We want China to end poverty, to overcome uh, the hundred years of humiliation, so-called, the great uh, difficulties of the 19th century, uh, indeed, uh, up to really the start of the rapid economic growth in 1978. And that will be good. Why should there be controversy? Why should there be conflict? And John was right and I was wrong. Uh, because there is confrontation and there's conflict. I'm more right than he is, though, not in prediction, but in saying there's no reason for this conflict. This is not some fundamental struggle of survival. This is not some fundamental confrontation of two systems. This is not what Biden absurdly said upon taking office that the great struggle of our age is democracy versus autocracy. None of this. 
This is what Mearsheimer said. China is rich and powerful. The United States is rich and powerful. Great powers have controversy over nothing more than the fact that they're each rich and powerful. That's a dumb reason for controversy, by the way. An even worse reason to blow up the world uh, or to talk about war as our politicians do. And my view is that we are being exposed to the unbelievable foolishness of our politicians every day. Uh, hotheads who have not had the benefit of being at the Chinese Institute know nothing know no history, have no context, uh, are uh, ignorant, should get a passport, should go for a trip, should enjoy a holiday, uh, and come back, uh, calm down. But they don't. So Mearsheimer was right. We are in a really dangerous uh, situation with China, but I'm also right. I can't see any single underlying reason for it that is a serious reason for confrontation. In economics, there's no such thing as China's gains being our losses. China is not a threat to the US economy. China is not a threat to US prosperity. China is not a threat to the US political <coughs> system. We are the threat to the, little, to the US political system. So there's nothing that has happened that gives me any worry about China. What gives me worry is about the structure of how the two countries are relating. So the second uh, influential uh, piece that I would refer to to understand this is a uh, remarkable essay, terrible in my view, by a former colleague of mine uh, when we were at Harvard together, Robert Blackwell, well-known, one of our leading diplomats, and he wrote a piece for the Council on Foreign Relations in, I think, 2016. It may be 2015, but it was about U.S. grant strategy and China. It's really worth reading. Fascinating. Again, highly predictive, but terrible in my view, to put it bluntly. And I am blunt, so uh, I want you to understand my point of view. So what Blackwell, Ambassador Blackwell wrote in 2015 or 2016 with Ashley Hellis, who's co-author, is that, and it's there vividly, so it will really help if you haven't read it to understand the weirdness of what's going on. He wrote that America's grand strategy from the beginning of our country has been hegemony. First it was hegemony over the eastern seaboard, then it was hegemony over North America, uh, then it was hegemony over the Americas, then it was the idea of global hegemony, uh, that the U.S. should be the uh, dominant power in every region of the world uh, and not brook even competition in any other region uh, of a regional hegemon, so-called. These are all concepts of international relations. They don't make too much sense to me, frankly, uh, in economics, but in any event, this is how our strategists think about things. So he wrote that that is our strategy to be dominant. And China is a threat to that strategy. That is absolutely true. If your strategy is to be dominant, well, China is a big threat to that. Because how can you be dominant if there's a very successful country that happens to be four times larger in population, is doing very well, thank you, turns out hundreds of thousands of incredibly skilled PhDs in the sciences and technology. What is this dominance? How about being productive? How about being peaceful? How about having a nice life? How about having universal health coverage or other decent things which we might have in this country if we actually thought about it? But dominance, no. 
then China's a threat, if that's your definition, which is mind-boggling to me because suppose the whole world had the idea that the only goal is to be dominant. Well, if that is the way, then John Mearsheimer's right. It's all a tragedy because not everybody can be dominant. And if that's your view, I suggest you go first to a psychologist, <laughs> a psychiatrist, uh, or a good counselor, or a good friend who could help calm you down and tell you about the good things in life, but not the importance of being dominant because that really does create a problem if that were generalized. You could think about it in a Kantian way. That does not work uh, as a categorical imperative if everybody is aiming for dominance. So, but in this essay of Blackwell, we, our grand strategy is to be dominant. And so he writes very clearly, China's rise is no longer in America's interest. Uh-huh. That's pretty weird. Now, we should understand a couple of basic things. China is roughly the same size as the US economy right now in aggregate. Depends how you measure things. There are always two ways to measure things. One is at the prices of each country's own markets, and then you convert the yuan uh, output to dollar output with the market exchange rate, and that's called market prices. And the other is a common set of prices that you apply to the goods and services of each country. That's called purchasing power parity adjusted prices. And by the market prices, China's economy in the aggregate is something like three quarters of the size of the US in dollar terms. China's four times larger. So that would mean three quarters times one quarter or three sixteenths the size or roughly uh, in per capita terms 20% of the US uh, um, economy in total size three quarters. If you look at it at international prices or purchasing power adjusted prices, China's a bigger economy. And the IMF gives us data all the time in what is called the World Economic Outlook. You can go to imf.org and just look at the data, which I do 10 times a day for my job. Uh, and if you look at the purchasing power adjusted prices, China is about 30% larger than the United States in absolute size. So 1.3 divided by 4, because the population is 4 times larger. So in per person terms, about 30% or 35% of the US. China's poorer per capita than the United States, but it's a big economy because 1.4 billion people is a lot more than 335 million people, which is the US population. Now, that's freaking out the policymakers in the US. They're bigger. How dare they be bigger? But it's kind of arithmetic. The only way that China could be smaller than the US is to stay at a per capita income less than a fourth of America. But why should they? <clears throat> because China's filled with clever people, with good entrepreneurs, with technology. Technology flows in this world. It always has and it will continue to. And China now is absolutely in the front ranks of scientific breakthroughs and of technological innovation, arguably ahead in many, many sectors, uh, comparable in many and behind in some, but a superpower in science and technology and with superb universities and all of the things that make for a high income country. And why not? China was the world leader for 1,000 years at least. 
Uh, it uh, lost that lead by a terrible policy era, error in the year 1434, uh, when uh, the Ming court stopped the great fleet of uh, Admiral Zheng He, and uh, China went uh, protectionist, and uh, the next time uh, it uh, was really deeply exposed to the world is when uh, British steamers were uh, coming up the river to uh, bomb the uh, uh, to, to bomb the Qing uh, uh, imperial properties uh, in uh, in uh, the uh, first Opium War. So China is going to be successful, and it's not going to stay at less than a quarter of U.S. per capita income. It's going to continue to grow. And incidentally, you read these days op-eds, oh, China's miracle's over, uh, China's finished, the Chinese economy's collapsing. This is so ignorant, I can't even tell you. Uh, China, by the way, ha will have business cycles like the United States does. It will have uh, financial booms and busts. Uh, nobody has figured out how to avoid financial crises in the last 300 years of market economy. So China, no doubt, has uh, too much debt in some uh, cities uh, and in uh, some real estate enterprises, no doubt. But China's going to continue to grow, and it's going to continue to narrow the gap with the United States in per capita terms. It's going to be bigger than the United States uh, in absolute terms. It already is by one good measure, and it will be by the other good measure without doubt, unless there's global calamity of some sort, which uh, I'm putting aside for the moment. And so the whole idea of American grand strategy is really messed up. And that is one large part of our problem right now. What Blackwell and Tellus recommended in this essay in 2015 or 2016, um, and when you read something on the Council on Foreign Relations, usually what's written is already policy, so it's letting the public know what the thinking in Washington is. It's not really even a trial balloon. It's already what's established. Blackwell says that China's rise is no longer in America's interest, and then there's a list of things that should be done. We should use trade policy to stop uh, China's export growth. We should restrict the flow of technology to China. We should bolster our military alliances uh, along the Pacific Rim countries. We should form trade groups uh, in Asia that don't include China. One of the weirdest ideas imaginable, by the way, if they would ever look at a map, they would see that this is not really the most sensible idea in the world. But grown-ups in Washington, they're not they're physically grown-ups. Uh, they actually did this. Uh, this was the whole idea of the TPP. Stupider, I can't imagine. But we have grown-ups that say, let's have a trade agreement in Asia where China's the lead trade partner of every one of the countries, and clever us, we won't include China. Okay, This is what passes for public policy. So, Blackwell listed all the things that we should do. And we're doing all of them. First, in the instability of the Trump period, where there's a lot of noise to signal, so you never knew day to day what was really going on, nor did anyone else, including the president. But he started this process of unilateral trade measures and barking at China and uh, generally trying to uh, raise tensions. And then Biden came in, and I thought there would be some uh, more grown-up behavior, uh, as I said. And actually, it got worse uh, because it became more systematic, more systematically wrong. So what Biden did is just going through the list of, that Blackwell set out in 2016. 
uh, or 2015, which is all the measures one takes of containment. And this is, one should understand this is the third round of American policy in this regard. It was invented for the Soviet Union, and it was deployed in the 1950s vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. And then, interestingly, it was deployed in a lighter way against Japan at the end of the 1970s, at the end of uh, the 1980s and early 1990s, because Japan became so successful that even though Japan was our ally and has no army and everything else, Japan basically became an enemy uh, in, in uh, economic terms, and the United States landed very heavily on Japan and said, you can't export anymore to us, and you have to agree to that, you have to overvalue your currency by 50%, and you have to do all sorts of things because we're not going to let you uh, continue to have the success. And we stopped Japanese growth. So this is the third try of this. But China's not Japan. Uh, Japan is uh, 125 million people, and China's 1.4 billion people, and Japan is under the US security umbrella, and China is an independent superpower, and it's not going to sit still uh, the way that Japan did in the early 1990s. China's going to figure out its way around all of this. But that was a big part of what we're seeing right now. So in a deep sense, Mearsheimer was right. China did nothing special to provoke any of this other than achieving rapid economic growth and economic progress. I see nothing extraordinary, of course. Every claim of China's success is they stole it from us, they, they cheated. This is uh, both fantasy and prejudice mixed together with the fact that everybody steals a bit from everybody else, so there was nothing special about uh, what China did. But in any event, it is the playbook contained China and that's a big part of what's going on. There's one other part of what's happening in our relationship, which is more economic, but also playing a role. And that is that when China achieved its economic success, heavily based on export-led growth, and heavily based on export-led growth to the US market, just as Adam Smith said, this made the US richer, it made China richer, it was a win-win proposition, uh, the strong uh, interrelations of China and the United States. But what you learn from trade history and trade theory, both, is that a win-win proposition at the aggregate level that the US became a richer economy because China was becoming a richer economy also went alongside inequalities within the United States, some of which arose from trade itself. So in international trade, there are losers as well as winners. The most basic theorem of international trade, going back to Smith and David Ricardo and Paul Samuelson in the 20th century, is that the winners win more than the losers lose so that the overall size of the economy grows. And for everybody to win from trade, the winners should compensate the losers. So the idea is a growing economy, which the US has had, should be enough for everybody to rise in that economy, but instead, there are pockets in our, not just pockets in our society, uh, significant parts of our society that are not rising, they're falling. So the US has become very rich, and the rich part of the United States has become really rich, and there are two parts of our society that are hurting. One is specifically places that are in the import competition with China. And that is the Midwest to an important extent. And those happen to be swing states in presidential elections. So 
Wisconsin, Minnesota, <coughs> Ohio, my home state of Michigan, Indiana, Pennsylvania, and so forth, a lot of places there were hit by very uh, high quality, low cost Chinese manufactured exports. And the second part of our society that's been hit in general is people with educational attainment of high school or less, because our societies absolutely diverged between university education and high school education on every dimension of well-being, including life expectancy, including health, including income levels, and so on. Now, in international trade theory and practice, the winners should help the losers. But we're a kind of nasty society. I think I would like to make that clear. Uh, our political system was invented in the British mode of John Locke. John Locke, the philosopher at the end of the 17th century. And John Locke's idea was that you own your own labor and nobody should take it away from you. And that is pretty deeply embedded in the American psyche, which is, that's mine, thank you. And I don't want to be taxed. And we are a low tax society that complains endlessly about taxes. That's the American tradition. In fact, there would be no United States of America other than for a tax revolt. The British wanted to put a little bit of tax on the Americans to help pay for the post-1763 uh, costs uh, after the Seven Years' War, and the colonists said, hell no, we don't have to pay any taxes, and no taxes uh, without representation, and by the way, no taxes with representation <laughs> is the American way as well, because our Congress is bought off by rich people who tell them, don't you dare ever pay, charge us more taxes. That's how the American political system works. So, simply, the winners don't like to compensate the losers in the United States. In fact, they like to say, you're losers. And so, Trump ran on this basis. Instead of running on what a nice party in Europe would run on a social democratic platform, that says, you know, we're all one society and we're awfully rich, and we should make sure that even if you lose your job, you have health care, uh, and uh, college education is too expensive, so we'll make sure that it's affordable. That's what a nice place would do. What Trump ran on was something completely different. He ran on tax cuts for the rich, and China is the one causing you all this you see? Thank you, Donald. Uh, China's the one causing you all this pain. They stole your jobs. And I'm never going to let them get away with that. And so intersecting with our grand strategy, which is uh, ridiculous, is the protectionism that comes from a society in which Winners don't compensate losers, but winners deflect the blame by blaming foreigners. And Trump's whole campaign was, you can blame everyone else except rich people. Rich people we give tax cuts to, but blame the, uh, the people coming up from the border from Mexico, or blame the Chinese, or blame the foreigners. That plays well. Uh, it makes a nasty society even nastier and more disorganized and disoriented, and he did a very good job of that. And the Democrats, what used to be my party before I decisively left it, uh, I have no home politically. Uh, I'm just disgusted by all of it. Um, the Democrats learned the lesson of 2016, which is, oh, protectionism is the way to win power. So the Democrats are always learning from the Republicans. They learned from the Republicans in the 1980s 
always advocate for tax cuts. That's how Reagan became so popular. And then the Democrat, and remember, well, you don't remember, but if you're as old as I am, you remember Walter Mondale said, he's going to raise taxes. I'm going to raise taxes. He's going to raise taxes, too. He just won't tell you. And Mondale lost 49 states uh, by saying that. And since then, no Democrat has said, we'll raise taxes. They just follow the Republicans. Then it used to be that the Republicans were free traders, and then Trump cleverly uh, exploited uh, the widening inequalities in the United States and turned it into an anti-China protectionism. And then the Democrats have learned that too. So, and then we have our grand strategist of our day, Jake Sullivan, uh, who uh, put the two pieces together and said, we can be protectionist and uh, use this to contain China and win elections and he's made a huge mess of everything uh, by basically advising and helping to guide a policy where Biden came in and decided to double down on the anti-China sentiment and the anti-China policies. So in the first year of the administration, where I had a lot of former friends, they're not my friends anymore, I mean, I like them still, they don't like me anymore. Um, but anyway, I said, oh, now reach out to your counterparts. We know all the technocrats in China, all the economic technocrats, of course, because we trained a lot of them. There are students, uh, there are friends for 30 years or 40 years. They said, no, 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 the White House has said no contact. You can't have contact. We're reviewing our China policy. So for the first year, there was no discussion, basically. Even at the technocratic level, it was amazing. So wrong-headed, by the way. As an academic, I could keep all the contacts, talk to people, <coughs> see friends, visit Beijing before COVID uh, hit. Um, and uh, at least keep open channels, but the administration, no open channels at all. And then the idea was the tension must be good for our politics. We'll show how tough we are, we'll continue containment, we'll uh, be more protectionist, we'll have a build in America policy, which is what uh, Trump is, uh, not Trump, what uh, Biden is trying to do with the Infrastructure Act and the Inflation Reduction Act and so forth. And that is how things went basically until about six months ago. I would add in Nancy Pelosi's absolutely absurd and reckless trip to Taipei. You just can't imagine more irresponsibility than that, in my opinion. And she is enormously irresponsible uh, and uh, just playing for the home crowd. But she went, and so Taiwan is added to this, and President Tsai uh, in Taiwan has also been, in my opinion, irresponsible by uh, rhetoric that is very loose, very dangerous, and in the midst of all of these other tensions, uh, just uh, raising the stakes in a way that allow our worst hotheads, and if you want our very worst hothead, it's Lindsey Graham, uh, dumber you cannot get, uh, and uh, more militaristic you cannot get. He wants war everywhere. This week it's with Iran, but uh, before that it was with China, before that it was with uh, Russia. Uh, so this is really our state of affairs, that the protectionism, the grand strategy, the uh, irresponsibility of uh, Washington politicians, I think created all of this. I can't see, China made one, one mistake, by the way, uh, rhetorically. 
And that was in 2014 when China launched the Made in China 2025 policy, which is a very smart policy calling for China to become leader in technology in 10 major areas. China said not that we want to advance in these areas. China said we want to dominate in these areas. <laughs> we want to lead in these areas. That was not a good idea. It would have been much smarter to say, we want to advance in these areas. We could have saved a lot of grief by uh, a different uh, kind of uh, rhetoric. So this is my basic interpretation of where we are right now. I said that it came to about six months ago when things were really boiling. I mean, very dangerous, the balloon incident the war in Ukraine going not the way that the United States wanted or expected, another debacle of US foreign policy, terrible debacle, because that's a war that never should have happened, and it was a war caused by this relentless idea of NATO enlargement to Ukraine, which is, <laughs> talk about red lines, it's like Taiwan, but from Russia's point of view. Uh, you don't put the US military on the Ukraine-Russia border, and they couldn't figure that out because they're not very clever at thinking through the eyes of the other side. So six months ago, things were really getting out of hand, and here we are. I think they decided about six months ago this is getting, this, this is not good. Uh, we need to start dialing back. And so that's why several uh, of our cabinet uh, 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 secretaries went uh, to China, uh, why the rhetoric was toned down. Still, they can't quite calibrate this because even when, say, Janet Yellen went, uh, <coughs> and she was uh, uh, saying we want good relations, Biden was at the same time signing another unilateral executive order to tighten the restrictions on technology exports to China. So we can't so far sustain quiet and calm. But I think the intention right now is with an overloaded US foreign policy, a failing war in Ukraine, a disaster in the Middle East, um, a president that's very unpopular, uh, running against a probable convicted felon. It's a great scene. Um, they want not so much tension in the next 12 months, and I think that that is the goal right now. And since there's no deep reason for this conflict, other than the ones that I've described, it would not be hard to dial back the tensions. It's not as if we are at dire loggerheads over anything real. We are in a constructed confrontation out of mindsets, not out of direct clash of interests. So finally, I am late and have to go and am uh, hogging the mic. Uh, China will have its ups and downs. But the main direction is not like that. The main direction is up. Uh, the most basic thing to watch is education, technology, and innovation. And on that, China's in the first ranks. And for an economy at China's level of development, that's the key. And that's not going away. That's going to continue. And China is leader rightly in many important technologies for the next 30 years, in uh, digital technologies, uh, in electric vehicles, in renewable energy, and many, many things. And the US might try to, might continue to try to uh, contain China, but it can't do it. Even the technology cutoffs will not have much effect at all. China's busy innovating around the microchips, and I would not worry too much about that. And if the US blocks the US market for China's goods, there's a whole world 
outside of the U.S. that wants Chinese goods, and that's what the Belt and Road Initiative and other similar initiatives of China, like the BRICS uh, expansion, are after. So all in all, China will continue to develop. We should view that absolutely positively. It means better lives for the Chinese people. It means better opportunities for the world economy. It's better for the United States. China's progress is plus for the United States. And we should try to help our politicians make sense. Thank you very much.